so thank you very much for inviting the IEA along today. Um, I hope we can be of help. It's our job. Um, thank you personally for inviting me. I'm a New Zealander. Uh, that's not an excuse, but I come from a country with four and a half million people. Um, the geographical size of New Zealand is very similar to a lot of the, the Nordic and Baltic countries. Uh, we're a small country in a big world. Um, I'm probably as, uh, where I come from is as far away from the Nordic region as you can get without coming back around the world home. But we have a lot of, of similarities. So today the accents are a little different, but the attitudes are the same. And um, the, there's a lot of those attitudes that come from coming from a small country. So um, I'm enjoying myself today. Um, so let's talk about energy efficiency and renewable energy and some international perspectives. Um, this graph is from our um, most recent work in um, ETP, our, our group that does energy technology and um, policies modelling work. Um, it's one of our roadmap series and if any of you had the large book or went to the presentations you probably would have seen this before. But it basically talks about modelling the, the future in a roadmap sense of, of energy possibilities for the world. And you can see here, um, we often make the distinction between OECD countries, developed countries, and non-OECD countries. And we can see a lot of growth in energy demand happening in those countries. Um, it also talks about uh, the, the future growth of, of uh, economies, um, societies, and the impacts that has on global systems like uh, the global emissions. And you see here a number of scenarios, the six degree scenario, the four degree, and the two degree scenario. So these are the, the scenarios that talk about the implications on global temperatures resulting from energy use. And we face choices as, as a world, it's that simple. We face choices that aren't that pleasant. Six degrees starts to seriously impact on us. Two degrees is somehow tolerable and we should try and get there. But if we want to get to two degrees, um, we need to literally halve our CO2 emissions. So we face a challenge, and I don't think I've heard anyone here today hasn't said that we face this challenge, we recognise this challenge, and we're up for trying to do something about this challenge. So that's a good place to start from. Um, we know we need to decouple energy use from economic activity, and a lot of countries have made some good progress here. Um, and again, there are different challenges for the developed and the developing world. <coughs> But this is quite critical if we do want to make this 2DS um, target, if we do want to get to a stage where limiting uh, global uh, temperature increases is something that we could tolerate. So we have a lot of work to do to further improve energy intensity. But if you look at the trends globally at a, a developed and developing world perspective, you have see the progress that has been made can be continued and needs to be continued. And so we can sort of say we have made some progress, we know we need to do more. It takes a collective effort, it takes, uh, we literally need to tap every opportunity to get there, every sector. We spoke this morning about the targets, you all have 10% targets for transport, uh, for renewable energy. It's the single biggest challenge, I think. It's very hard to compete with a cup of diesel or, or a half a litre of petrol. There aren't a lot of substitutes for a portable, high energy content fuel. And I think it's one of the world's biggest challenges of what we do about transport. If you don't have transport, you don't have freight and you don't have trade. There are big implications about that. We all know we need to upgrade our existing <laughs> building fleets. In the developed world, they have to start building very low energy buildings. Um, the, the, if we look at a European context, it's quite different from, say, North Africa where the next 10 megacities will have 20 million uh, populations. Lagos, Dar es Salaam are just starting to realise the challenges that they face. They have to build extremely low energy buildings if they are to work as cities at all. So we have challenges in every sector. The power generation sector needs to decarbonise. Um, my sister unit has been working with China on how we can use carbon price instruments to send signals through the Chinese electricity generating sector to um, incentivise low carbon production of electricity. The Chinese like the proposal. It's starting to grapple with 10% of global emissions. And, and that's substantive. We can make some progress there. Um, electricity demand continues to grow. I think this is really interesting. Uh, it, 
you can do things with electricity you can't do with any other fuel, and I suspect a lot of you realise that. And so there will always be a consumer imperative and always be a consumer demand for electricity. Decarbonising electricity <coughs> supply is critical, and there's enough presentations today talking about efforts to do that here, and so that's good. Um, we need a lot of different solutions, whether it's at the demand side, the end use, whether it's at the generation sector, whether it's fuel switching. Um, we need to do all these things. I'm personally a little bit challenged right now about the contribution that nuclear can make. If we look at Fukushima, what's happened in Japan there, we look at the repercussions around the world, it, it's hard to really have confidence that we will get the contribution from nuclear to greenhouse gas reductions in the future. It, it's, it's hard to see that. Uh, carbon capture and storage is, is like a small child that you wonder when will it grow. It, it has to come away still if it's to contribute. So we're a little bit concerned about that. Renewables is surging ahead, thank goodness. But as we develop more renewables, we need smarter price signals for renewables. And there are, at the end of the day, environmental limits to renewables as well. And so we really face a challenge here around how much are we asking of energy efficiency? For me, personally, in my role, this is a worrying question because how much do you expect from energy efficiency? It's a big challenge. And it's already a large, one of the largest contributions to mitigating climate change. So we have some really big questions about how we're going to get there. Um, one of the things we're working on right now is a project called the Multiple Outcome Benefits of Energy Efficiency. We're all used to energy efficiency in terms of reduced kilowatt hours or reduced tonnes of oil equivalent or something, and we're all used to energy efficiency in terms of the greenhouse gas reduction benefits. There was a little bit of talk this morning about job creation from renewables. We don't really know a lot about the job creation from energy efficiency. We don't know a lot about what happens with the consumer surplus that's generated when consumers are spending less on electricity. We know a little bit about the health benefits of energy efficiency. If you make houses in cold climates warmer, it does have an impact on the health of the occupants. We're starting to learn about that. Um, the country where I come from, New Zealand, we know that the health benefits, direct uh, economic benefits to government are paying for the insulation in houses, not the energy savings. So we're starting to evolve some sense of some other outcomes from energy efficiency than just kilowatt hours or greenhouse gas reductions. We have a significant piece of work to do to understand these benefits. The context for this forum today is a green growth forum, and I've heard a lot of talk this morning about energy um, efficiency of renewable energy, but I don't hear a lot of connections to the social and economic impacts that we seek from green growth. And we need to do some more work about making those connections. We're doing this renewable energy, energy efficiency business because it makes for a better society, a better economy, as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I think there's a real challenge to draw those connections. How does renewables and energy efficiency contribute to a green, wealthier, better off, better socialised society. So we have a lot of work to do there. So this is about a two-year project. We're working on this. And I think it's important to realise that these outcome benefits happen at the level of individuals, at a national accounts level, at a regional level across Europe, for instance, but also at an international level. And um, we, we have a lot of work to do on mapping this and understanding it. In 2008, the G8 asked the, energy efficient, uh, the, the International Energy Agency if it would help it understand what are the energy efficiency policies that we should pursue. They said energy efficiency is important, what must we do? And we developed with them um, 25 energy efficiency recommendations. They cover seven different sectors, so we span those different sectors that we saw before that all need to be developed. Um, What's it worth to us? We think it's worth about a trillion US dollars a year in energy savings. Eh, that's about the scale of, of, of broader fossil fuel subsidies. If you measure the direct subsidies, it's around 450 odd billion. If you start to measure some of the indirect subsidies, it gets closer to about a trillion. So actually we know we've got a little bit of an economic balancing act here. At one level, subsidies that aren't helping us are of a similar order of magnitude to the savings that we're trying to achieve. So it, it looks like it's economically plausible to achieve this. Um, at, at the time this was developed, 2008, the, 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 the subtitle or the catch cry that came with this was, 
worldwide implementation now. And there was a, a commitment or a desire to say, let's fully implement these 25 measures. We designed them so they were cost effective, so they dealt with identified barriers, so that they were politically palatable. You know, G8 said, give us stuff we can actually do rather than get voted out if we do them. And so there were the, the, these are good measures, um, and we said, let's implement them now. There was a sense of prioritisation and urgency and commitment. Where have we got to? Um, in 2011, we, we measured progress towards these implementing these policies across um, our member countries, and some of the Nordic and, and Baltic countries are represented here. I mean, the good news is that you know, you're in the top 10 countries around the world in progressing these policies. You know, you're better than average. That's great. But if you look at this, um, you still all have some measures that aren't implemented. You have some that are planning to implement still, some that you have made substantial progress on, and some that you're fully implementing. So there's still scope to expand what you're currently doing. That's the first sort of takeout from this, I think. Um, what's really interesting, we did this analysis first in 2009, we did it again in 2011, and we said, everyone's made progress, this is great. You know, it's really good to see this is advancing in a sort of a steady way, that's good. Um, we need to do this again in another couple of years to track how this is going. Good progress is being made. We should pat ourselves on the back, but we all know there's more to be done. Um, electricity is a really interesting challenge. All around the world, the demand for electricity keeps growing. Um, I, I think in the Nordic Baltic region, you're managing demand and supply quite well. Um, I'm used to countries around the world where they're talking about 30% supply demand imbalances, and it's not an excess of supply. Um, so increasingly every country I speak to they're starting to talk about well we have a, a, a grid capacity problem somewhere or we're struggling to keep generation um, up with demand and so this is um, uh, this is an increasing area of energy insecurity for us all particularly as we become more and more dependent on electricity one of the emerging problems that we're seeing right now is the whole area of network connected standby our houses are heading towards our households are heading towards a stage where there will be 10 appliances that will be connected to the network, to the World Wide Web, in order to get instructions, give instructions, download increasingly large amounts of data. The, the, the demand for this network connected data transfers is growing exponentially, the bandwidth is growing exponentially, and as a result, the power to run network connected capacity is growing exponentially as well. It could be of the scale of France's generation base. Um, interesting challenges in electricity. It has to be one of our focuses. Our renewables are making great progress. Um, big growth in solar PV, big growth in um, the cost reductions in all these technologies, and a big growth in wind as well. So, you know, I think we should feel comfortable. We're, we're making good progress there. Not quite so with energy efficiency. We have a ways to go. Um, and I don't roadmaps. Um, Lots of countries are developing roadmaps. We're currently doing a roadmap exercise for the Nordic countries. Uh, we're taking the global roadmap and operating at a Nordic level to give, uh, I guess, a, I guess a, a better resolution of the possibilities for the Nordic region. And um, that's a piece of work that's underway. There are a lot of issues to consider with roadmaps. At one level, they can be quite an academic exercise because without commitment and leadership, not a lot's going to come from them. We need to get the market-based practices in place for the right incentives. While a lot of progress has been made with the renewable energy, if we want to make the next tranche of, 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 of growth in renewable energy, I think we need better market signals to make um, better investments. Um, the same thing applies for energy efficiency. Where a premium can be gained in a dynamic marketplace from energy efficiency or renewables, that premium has to be exposed. If you're a little country like the Netherlands saying, how do we meet our renewable energy targets, it's much easier to do that with a dynamic market where they could invest at other places in the market than just in the Netherlands. The place is already full of windmills. Um, how do energy efficiency and renewable energy cooperate and help with other priorities? It doesn't help if we talk about energy efficiency or renewables in isolation. They're contributing to a, a wealth of outcomes in society that are driven by a wealth of drivers, economic ones, social ones, environmental ones, you name it. And the connections across the policies are critical. 
Um, we heard a little bit of this morning about the, the, the water directive. This is a, a, a big challenge for anyone dependent on a hydro. So how do we get these, the, these connections and cooperations? Um, in all cases, we need to ensure we've got a balanced portfolio of sustainable energy options. I, I showed you those slides before of the, the progress in the 25 measures. The area we've made the most progress was in transport in, in, over that two-year period from 2009 to 2011. But it's the area we were starting from a zero balance. There was virtually nothing happening in transport in 2009 across the world and, or across the IA member countries. We made a big step forward. But we had a very imbalanced portfolio of activity. It, transport was almost missing. So we need to be alert to that. We need to balance the long and the short term. That's, that's obvious, I think. Um, I'm constantly reminded that we don't understand enough about end use, how we use energy in a house or in a factory, um, how we, the incentives that, that individuals have to, to manage that. So we, we face some big data gaps there. Um, the worst sector is probably the commercial building sector. In some national accounts it's called other. You know, and we just don't know how commercial enterprises use energy. What we do know is that electricity demand in commercial businesses is growing faster than in the residential sector. Um, what we do know is that that has to increasingly be the intention of, of uh, the, uh, draw the attention of governments if they're going to do something about that. Um, I, I would love to see a lot more work happening on evaluation. Do we really understand the job creation impacts of renewable energy and energy efficiency. We can't use simple labour market multipliers anymore because often the markets are unique subsets of a general market and, and it, does, it doesn't work. So we need to understand this job creation dynamic very well. Finishing what you start, the G8 made quite a commitment to energy efficiency and I suspect over the years other priorities have kicked in. Certainly the recession did. There's a sense of, if we look back to the commitments we made in 2008, we have to ask how far have we come, what have we achieved, do we know we still need to do more just to catch up with that original ambition. We're committed to a long-term journey and this has to be a journey of learning. And um, I think that evaluation is critical to move forward, as are the market-based practices to underpin it. I think that's the end of my speech. Thank you. All right. So, if there are some questions right away uh, from the floor, I have just one remark. Maybe I'm glad that you brought up the uh, dilemma, basically, between the energy efficiency and renewable energy. And say it might not be a dilemma, but can also support uh, it with each other. Uh, one of the interesting uh, contradictions, maybe, that you can see in in the Nordic and Baltic countries as well, is that there is uh, quite a lot of uh, households mm. who use biomass in their heat production. Mm. Once we now go into the energy efficiency increases in their houses, you might actually decrease the share of renewables. It, it depends how you do that. Um, we, we, um, as with a lot of Nordic countries, in New Zealand we had, we had a, a lot of households that use the solid wood heaters, uh, wood stoves, to heat their homes. And we called it the 500 megawatt power station in the woodshed, because it literally added up to that sort of uh, contribution. It was a power station's worth of heating. Um, in the last six or seven years we've seen a massive influx of, of split system heat pumps, air source heat pumps. These are Asian sourced heat pumps, the COP is very good and the environment we're in, the external air quality, is a good heat source for those heat pumps. Um, they're dominating the home heating market now. And, you know, I've had everyone from renewable um, uh, propo proposers to saying, look, the, these are just efficient heaters. And I'm saying, well, actually, they're active solar collectors. Um, I've had a lot of people saying, well, this is the, this is the end. Uh, we'll have to build all these power stations to power them. Um, look, it's a technology where energy, a very high level of energy efficiency and a very high level of, resource, uh, of renewable uh, adoption go hand in hand. And I think it's a perfect example. These things actually can complement each other incredibly well. Um, 
in the longer run, we need petrol for chainsaws to cut timber. We need to truck the timber into town. That has a fossil fuel implication. Um, if we can generate a renewable electricity resources, run heat pumps with them, that's probably a lower net emission situation than, than using wood stoves. Each country has their resources to, to make the best of. 